All right, 2.6 is about radical functions. Uh, in 2.5, we went over just some basics about radicals and how they relate to rational exponents. Um, so now let's talk about how to, two main things we wanna do here is we wanna be able to solve radical equations and then we also wanna be able to graph radical functions. So <clears throat> uh, to solve a radical equation, the way that we do that is we isolate the radical and then we raise both sides of the equation to an appropriate power to clear the radical. Um, it's possible we might have to repeat that step more than once in order to clear all of the radicals, but eventually we will clear them all. Um, and then just like with rational equations, we have to check for extraneous solutions here by plugging our answers into the original equation. Um, when we go to check for extraneous solutions, so when we check our answers, we might end up with non-real results. And some pre-calculus textbooks don't like this, so they'll reject those kinds of solutions. In our class, we're gonna be fine with those, right? So if you end up with uh, complex, with, with solutions that give you complex answers when you plug them back in, that's going to be fine as long as the statements they make are true. So if you end up, so if you plug something in and you end up with something like 3i equals 3i, that's true. But if you end up with a statement like 3i equals negative 3i, that's false. And you would reject that solution. So let me walk you through. Uh, I've got four examples. <clears throat> in part A, we've got two radicals in this problem. They're both already isolated. So it's set up and ready for us to go, uh, to go ahead and clear the radical. And in this case, that's easy to do, right? We're just gonna raise both sides to the second power. Typically, you wanna raise both sides of the equation to the power of the index of your radical. In this case, the radical is two. So we're gonna raise both sides to the second power. We get two minus two x equals negative one minus x. And the rest is easy, right? Move the x over move the two over, divide by negative one, we get x equals three. Now we need to check this. It, it could be extraneous, right? So if we check it, we get square root two times two, or two minus two times three. We want to know if this equals negative one minus three. Uh, two minus six, is negative four. Negative one minus three is also negative four. So we get two i equals two i, that's true. So three is a solution, okay? Let's do another one. Part B. Now on this one, we, we have just one radical. It has not been isolated yet. So that's gonna be our first step. We don't want to square both sides right now. If you square the left-hand side, you're not going to clear the radical, okay? You've got to get the, the constant term over first. So let's move that one over. And now we can square both sides. The left-hand side squaring just undoes the radical and we're left with two x plus one. But on the right hand side, we have to FOIL, right? We have to FOIL. So we would have an x times an x, and then we'd have an x times a negative one, and then another negative one times x, that's gonna give us negative two x. And then a negative one times a negative one would be a positive one. This is a quadratic. We solve quadratics by moving everything over and then factoring. So if I move the two x and one over to the other side, we get x squared minus 4x, oh, plus zero, right? Just x squared minus 4x, that's nice. Now don't be fooled. At first glance, that seems like a difference of squares, but 4x is not a perfect square. So, so we wouldn't uh, factor this as x plus two times x minus two, it doesn't work. You're welcome to try it if you like, but it doesn't work, right? But what we can do is we can factor out an LCD. We have an x here. Both terms have an x in common, so we can take out an x and we're left with x minus four. This tells us that x equals zero or x minus four equals zero, All right? So x equals zero or x equals four. Now we've got to check these, right? They could be extraneous. So 
So checking x equals 0, we would have square root 2 times 0 plus 1 plus 1. We want to know if that equals 0. Well, here we have square root of 1 plus 1. We want to know if that equals 0. Square root of 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 does not equal 0, right? 1 plus 1 equals 2. So that tells us x equals 0 is not a solution. What about x equals 4? We want to know if 2 times 4 plus 1 plus 1 equals 4. Let's see. Square root of 8 plus 1 is square root of 9. Square root of 9 is 3. 3 plus 1 equals 4. Sure enough. Yep. So, so 4 works, right? So 4 is a solution. It's the only solution. Okay. Very good. Let's look at another one. Uh, just so that you know that we're not going to square both sides every single time. Here's a problem where we wouldn't square both sides. We're going to raise both sides to the fifth power in order to clear that radical of index 5, right? In order to clear that fifth root, we have to raise to the fifth power. But first, let's isolate it. So we'll add the 3. And then raise both sides to the fifth. We get 3x minus 7 equals 32. And add the 7 over and divide by 3. Very nice. When you have odd indices, you don't have to check your solutions. It's only when you have even indices that, uh, that you could run into problems. You're still welcome to check it if you'd like. It's just, it's just not necessary. It's optional when the index is odd. But yeah, here we have 5, fifth root of uh, 3 times 13 minus 7. Uh, minus 3, we want to know if that equals negative 1. 3 times 13 is 39. 39 minus 7 is 32. Square, or fifth root of 32 is 2, right? 2 minus 3 is indeed equal to negative 1. Um, part D. These are the most challenging ones because this is one where we're going to have to square both sides of the equation at least twice in order to solve it, right? So you'll notice we have two radicals, but unlike part A, right, on part A we had two radicals, but they were, that's all there was. There was just the two radicals. And on part D we have two radicals, but we also have this number on the outside of this other radical. So when we go to square both sides of this equation, we're not going to totally get rid of the radicals on the right-hand side. Um, so let's do it. No use complaining about it. We just got to get it done, right? So square root and the square cancel each other, leaving an x plus 3 on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, things are a little more complicated. I'm just going to write this out twice as a visual aid for us. Root x minus 2 times root x minus 2. Well, those radicals are just going to cancel. We're going to be left with x minus 2. Then we have root x minus 2 times 1. And then we have a 1 times root x minus 2. And then we have a 1 times a 1. Let's clean that up a little bit. Uh, so x minus 2 plus 1, negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, right? So we have x minus 1 plus, and then we have two copies of the same thing. So this is 2 times the square root of x minus 2. So as you can see, we did not quite manage to clear all of the radicals. So we've got to rinse and repeat, right? We've got to isolate. The, the good news is that we started with two radicals, and now we only have one, OK? So we did make some progress. Uh, so we've got to do that process again. We need to isolate this radical and then square both sides to clear it. And the really good news is that when we move this x over, the x is canceled, so that's nice. When we move the 1 over, we get 4 equals 2 radical x minus 2. When we divide by 2, we get 2 equals radical x minus 2. 
And now this is looking really simple, right? <laughs> now this is not scary at all. Square both sides. This is a piece of cake. 4 equals x minus 2. So x is 6. Let's check it. So we want to know if square root 6 plus 3 equals square root 6 minus 2 plus 1. Well, 6 plus 3 is 9, and square root of 9 is 3. 6 minus 2 is 4, square root of 4 is 2. Yeah, right? 2 plus 1 is 3. So x equals 6 works as a solution. We could get more and more complicated, right? We could have like multiple radicals going on. We could even have situations where we have maybe a square root on one side and then a cube root on the other. And man, those things, that would be very, very, very nasty to have to try to solve. But, but the, the general strategy is the same, regardless of what you're confronted with. What you do is isolate a radical, there are still more radicals in the problem. Rinse and repeat. And then once you're done, you just solve the equation you're left with. Always check for extraneous solutions when you have an indiscipline. So that's solving radical equations. You'll get a chance to practice that a little bit. Formations of radical equations by shifting. So first of all, let me just remind you from uh, from 2.0, the introduction to this chapter, these are the shapes of the four different kinds of radical functions that we want to be able to graph. So here's what square root x looks like. And it's kind of a unique looking graph in the sense that it doesn't continue on on the left-hand side or underneath or something like that. It just kind of starts right at 0, 0. And the reason for that is because this is the real uh, Cartesian plane. So uh, the only the only outputs that are going to show up in the in the real Cartesian planes plane are the real uh, are the real outputs, right? So if you plug in a negative input into the square root function, you're going to get a non-real output, and that's not going to show up in the graph. So that's why there's nothing over here on the left hand side of the graph, right? If you plug in like negative four you're going to get 2i as your output, but there's nowhere to graph 2i on this real coordinate system. So, so you only get uh, outputs that show up in the real plane if the inputs are positive when you're dealing with square root function. Now, you don't have the same problem with the cube root function, OK? Because with the cube root function, if you plug in like negative 8, well, cube root of negative 8 is just negative 2. It's still a real number, right? So, so with the cube root function, you still get this kind of more or less normal looking function. Um, points I want you to transform for the square root function, 0, 0, obviously. That's sort of your starting point, so it's a very important one to get on the graph. 1, 1. And again, don't, don't bother memorizing these. It's just if you plug in 1, you get, as the output, square root of 1, which is 1. And then I want you to plot 4, 2 as well. This will just give you the trajectory of the graph. If you only plot the first two points, then for all you know, it's a straight line, okay? So you've got to get at least a third point on there so you can start to see the curvature a little bit. Um, and, the, and the reason I'm using 4, 2 is because that's the next point where you're going to have integral solutions, right? Um, if you plug in like 2, that's legal. It's just that... that Square root of two is like 1.4 or something. It's this irrational number. And um, it's, so it's not very nice to graph. Same thing if you plug in three, right? Square root of three is like 1.7 something, but it's this irrational number. So instead we skip all the way on to four because four is a perfect square. When you take the square root of four, you just get two. So I want you to plot zero, zero, one, one, and four, two when you graph these things. Of course, not those exact points, but the they're, they're appropriate transformations, right? When you pop the cube root function, still, uh, again, I want you to plug in perfect cubes. So 0, 0. Uh, I want you to plug in 0, 1, negative 1, 8, and negative 8, right? Those are the first kind of set of uh, numbers you can plug in to get 
uh, integral outputs, 0, 1, negative 1, 2, and negative 2. These two functions you may have already been more or less familiar with before you entered this class. These two might be new. I would guess that these two functions are new for most of you. Maybe, maybe some of you have seen them, but I say most of you probably haven't. But I think they're really uh, cool functions, especially this one. This one, you see this little kind of cusp thing that you don't really see in any other functions that we've looked at uh, so far. But, um, but just talking about these, these graphs, x to the 3 halves, if you rewrite that as a radical, this is the square root of x cubed, OK? And because you're taking a square root, you can see why, just like with this one, you don't have any outputs when your x's are negative, right? Because if your x's are negative, then x cubed is going to be negative, and the square root of a negative number is not real. So it's not going to show up in the real plane. And then this function here, um, it has this cusp. The way you can kind of reason out why that should be, so this would be like the cube root of x squared, right? So it's sort of like you're, you're looking at the cube root function, only because you, you're squaring the values, they become positive. And so, so this thing down here, it just reflects over the x-axis, and so you get this, this uh, kind of sharp cusp. Anyway, um, let's just practice. So I think I have, oh goodness, I have eight. So I think I have eight of these. It says graph, find the intercepts, if any. I don't know how many intercepts I'm actually going to find here uh, because I, I don't want to waste a ton of your time. But, um, but let's practice graphing. So these are all square root functions, right? Transformations of square root functions. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to transform is the point zero, zero. Okay. And what this is telling me to do is to take the point zero, zero, move it three spaces to the right and two spaces up. We need a one, two, three, one, two. So there's my new starting point. So just like I've done on all of the other functions that we've plotted by transformations, I'm going to treat that as my new uh, origin for like my new axis system. And then I just plot these points, right? I go 1, 1, and 4, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2. And if I wanted, I could go out to 9, 3 but I'd be off the graph paper by that point. So that's what that function looks like. Uh, no need to try to find any intercepts here. There aren't any, right? <laughs> there, there are no intercepts. You're not going to have an x-intercept because this thing's shooting off that way. You're not going to have a y-intercept because that's the starting point of the function, right? So no x-intercepts, no y-intercepts. Let's do part b. f of x equals negative square root of x. What this negative on the outside does is it flips the function over vertically, right? So instead of going uh, over one up one, I'm going to go over one down one. Instead of going over four up two, I'm going to go over four down two. And like I said, if I wanted to get another point, I could go over nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then usually I'd go up three, but I'm going to go down three because of that negative sign in front. That's what my function looks like. OK, so it opens downwards. Now, contrast this with part C. Right? Instead of f of x equals negative square root of x, I have f of x equals square root of negative x. When the negative is on the inside of the radical, that, instead of flipping it over, or, or, um, vertically, it's going to flip it over horizontally. So usually the function opens up this way. With this negative sign, it's going to end up opening this way. And you can see that, right? It's like if I plug in 1 here, I'm going to get square root of negative 1, which is i, not real. So if I plug in positive numbers, I'm going to get, I'm going to get non-real outputs. So they're not going to show up in the graph. But if I plug in negative numbers, like if I plug in negative 1, Negative, negative 1 is positive 1, right? Square root of positive 1 is 1, so negative 1, 1 is on the graph. 
right? So I start to get the zero, zero is on the graph as well. If I plug in negative four, square root of negative, negative four is square root of positive four, which is two. One, two, three, four, one, two. Right? So that's the function I get. And then I could go over to nine, three, and that's the idea. Okay, so negative on the outside, it gets flipped over. Negative on the inside, it gets flipped to the left. Negative in both places, well then both things are gonna happen, right? So instead of going off this way, it's gonna go down that way, right? So we should have zero, zero, negative one, negative one, negative four, one, two, three, four, negative two. And if I wanted, I could go out negative nine, negative three. And that's what that one looks like. As far as intercepts are concerned, this one didn't have any. And these other three, they all have the same x and y intercepts, right? Zero, zero. So nothing, inter no nothing really interesting is happening there. Um, OK. If you were to try to, so let's say that you didn't have the graph, and you were just told find the intercepts without graphing the function. So then you don't really know what it looks like and you tried to find the intercepts, so you would say, well, zero equals square root x minus three plus two, right? This is to find the x-intercepts. Then you'd say negative two equals square root x minus three. And right away, you see an issue, right? Because the square root of a number can never be a negative number. So you know there's not going to be a solution here. But even if you didn't see that and you kept going, right? You square both sides and you add three. When you go to check this in the original, you're going to see you get a false statement, right? If I plug in 7, 7 minus 3 is 4, square root of 4 is 2, 2 plus 2 is 4, not 0, right? So that's extraneous. So, um, and then similarly, like if you try to find the y-intercept, something's going to go wrong where you're going to notice that, it, that uh, well, if you try to find the y-intercept, you plug in 0 for x, right? Plug in 0 for x, you get square root of negative 3, which is not real, so it's not going to show up in the graph. Anyway, um, so that's that idea. Let's look at the next page. This has some more interesting stuff on it. So I think on this page we're going to do one of each, right? So one of each of these uh, four types of functions. So here we've got square root x plus 3 minus 1. So I'm going to shift left 3 down 1. So one, two, three, down one. There's my new starting point. I'm not doing any reflecting. So it's gonna look like the normal uh, x squared function, but with that as my starting point, right? So one, 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 two, three, four, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three. The next one will be all the way out at 16. So I'm not gonna try to get that one on there, but that's what that looks like. Pretty easy to see what my x-intercept is. It should be the point negative two, zero. The y-intercept, that's a little bit less clear. It's about 0 0.7, I think. You just plug in zero for x, and you get root three minus one. It's about 0 0.7. Um, part f, cube root function, OK? Then shifted left, left one, up one. Left one, up one. So this is my new coordinate system. And then I'm just going to plot the regular cube root x function with respect to this new coordinate system. So I know that 1, 1 is on there. I know that uh, 8, 2 is on there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 2. And same thing in the negative direction. Negative 1, negative 1, negative 8. Three, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, negative 2. And there we go. OK. Here's one of these crazy uh, uh, fractional things. This one is like the, the square root of something cubed. So this is going to be the one that just exists on half of the graph, right? because I'm going to be taking a square root, so I can't have negative inputs. Um, OK. And it's been shifted left 2, down 3. 
left two, down three. So there's my new coordinate system. I know that zero zero is on there. I know that one one is on there. Uh, now, what were the other ones? Oh boy. Uh, so let's think. Uh, well, if I plug in two, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get two cubed is eight, and square root of eight. Well, that's not a whole number, so I don't want to plug in two. Probably don't want to plug in three either. What if I plug in four? Uh, square root of four is two. 2 cubed is 8. So I think 4, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So you see, I don't even have these things memorized. I just kind of reason about. Okay. So that's what that one looks like. I can't have negative inputs, right? Uh, so if I were to plug in, uh, well, if I was doing this re with respect to the original axes, this point right here would be, this would be a negative three, right? So a negative, if I plugged in negative three, I'd have negative three plus two is negative one, negative one cubed is negative one, squared of negative one is i, right? So that's not gonna show up. Nothing on this half of the graph is gonna show up. Um, it would be interesting to know maybe what the x and y intercepts are. Let's do that. So I have three. Then I raise both sides. In this case, if I want to clear this exponent, I'm going to have to raise both sides to the two thirds to clear it, right? Three to the two thirds, that's the cube root of three squared. So that's the cube root of nine. So X, I guess, would be uh, cube root of nine minus two. Uh, how much is that approximately? Oh, that's really small. That's about 0 0.08. <laughs> that's tiny. So I didn't do such a bad job graphing it, right? What about the y-intercept? <clears throat> So the y-intercept is going to be f of 0, 0 plus 2 to the 3 halves, minus 3. That's a square root of 8 minus 3, square root of 8. That's about negative 0 0.17. Um, anyway, really close together. but. That's how you get intercepts in case you were interested, right? So the x-intercept is root three or cube root nine minus two comma zero. Y-intercept is zero uh, root eight minus three. Well, let's do one more. <clears throat> uh, okay. This looks almost the same as that. The difference is the exponent, right? Here it was 3 halves, here it's 2 thirds. But still, it's been shifted left 2, down 3. Now, this is the one that looks kind of like the bird, right? It looks kind of like the birds that you would draw back in elementary school, <laughs> right? <clears throat> here I am just assuming that you drew birds the same way I did in elementary school. But it's because pretty much everyone around me drew birds that way. Okay, so definitely 1, 1 and negative 1, 1 are going to be on there. Uh, beyond that, I, I need to get at least one more point on here so I have a clear idea of what's going on. So beyond that, I think if I'm thinking of x to the 2 thirds, uh, so this is, in other words, this is a cube root of x squared. So if I'm thinking of this, if I plug in like 2, 2 squared is 4, cube root of 4 is not nice. So I don't want to plug in 2, probably. If I plug in 3, 3 squared is 9, cube root of 9 is not nice, so I probably don't want to plug in 3. If I plug in 4, 4 squared is 16, cube root of 16, 
Is that right? If I plug in four, yeah, four squared is 16. Yeah, that's not gonna be nice either. Five, probably not. I'm thinking maybe eight, because I, I need something that I can take the cube root of, right? So maybe eight, maybe eight would do the trick. If I do eight, right, cube root of eight is two, two squared is four. So I think eight, four is probably the next best one. So eight, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. There. And then I'm going to get the same thing on the other side, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four. Right about there. That's decent. Ooh, this one's interesting. I have two x intercepts here, right? So, so some a couple of x intercepts that you should get. I'm not going to work them out though. Of course, you also have a y intercept, but I'm not going to work out work out all those details. Uh, you should kind of know how that goes right at this point. So that's how graphing these things works. Um, two last examples. Let's uh, let's talk about calculating some derivatives. So there are two types of derivatives that I want to show you how to calculate here. Um, so I want to do square root of x plus 1, and then I want to do 1 over square root of x plus 1, so you kind of get a feel for how these things work. Because if you can do these two, then you can do most of the radical functions that you'll see. Um, so let's let's do it. So f prime of x is going to be limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h. I'm just going to cut to the chase and write down what f of x plus h is. f of x plus h is going to be x plus h plus 1, square root of x plus h plus 1. So it's f of x plus h minus f of x. That's just square root of x plus 1 divided by h. So we've got to get rid of this h in the denominator. As usual, that's the problem. If we plug in h, if we plug in 0 now, we're going to get something over 0. It's going to be undefined. The way that we get rid of the h in the denominator is not super intuitively clear. Uh, so I'm just going to give you the trick, right? The trick is to rationalize the numerator. And it's so weird because we spend so much time rationalizing the denominator on these things. But what we want to do in this case is rationalize the numerator. That'll eventually allow us to cancel that h. Uh, you'll see how, right? So let's do this. We're going to rationalize the numerator by multiplying by the conjugate of the numerator. Remember to change the sign in the middle. Let's see what we've got. So square root x plus h plus 1 times square root x plus h plus 1 the square roots are just going to cancel, leaving me with x plus h plus 1. When I do root x plus h plus 1 times root x plus 1, that's nasty, but check it out. When I do root x plus 1 times root x plus h plus 1, that's the same thing as what I had here, but the signs are different. So uh, the outer term and the inner term are just going to cancel each other, which is really nice. That means I don't have to bother writing them out. So I've done first. That was that. And then outer and inner counts, cancel. Then I need to do the lasts, right? Root x plus 1 times root x plus 1, the radicals are just going to cancel. I'm going to get a negative x plus 1. In the denominator, I'm not going to bother distributing the h. I'm just going to leave it. Square root x plus h plus 1 plus square root x plus 1. Now, the x's will cancel, the 1's will cancel. I'll be left with just an h in the numerator. So it's going to be h over h times 
the square root of x plus h plus 1 plus square root of x plus 1. Now these h's will cancel. We're left with 1 over square root x plus h plus 1 plus square root x plus 1. And look at that. We did it. We, we finally got rid of this h that we started with, right? That was that guy right there. And if we plug in 0 now, we're not going to get a 0 in the denominator. We're going to get root x plus 1 plus root x plus 1. That's just 2 times root x plus 1. So this is 1 over 2 times root x plus 1. OK, so there's the derivative. Okay, so there's that one. That one's not terrible. Let's take a look at this one. It's a little bit hairier. <laughs> Let's work on it. This is going to be the limit as h approaches 0. Uh, f of x plus h. f of x plus h is going to be 1 over x plus h plus 1. So there's f of x plus h minus f of x. That's 1 over square root x plus 1, all divided by h. Again, got to get rid of this h somehow. How are we going to do it? Well, the first thing that I notice is that we've got these complex fractions, right? We've got these little fractions within a larger fraction. I'd like to clear those complex fractions. So I'm going to do that by multiplying through by the LCD of these two little fractions. The LCD is square root x plus h plus 1 times square root x plus 1. So I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by uh, square root x plus h plus 1 times square root of x plus 1. Okay. When we distribute to the first term, the x plus h plus 1's will cancel and leave the x square root of x plus 1. When we distribute to the second term, the square root of x plus 1 will cancel, leaving us with the square root of x plus h plus 1. And in the denominator, nothing cancels <laughs> yet. Okay, so this is where I'm at at this point. At least, so I've got a bunch of radicals now, which isn't very nice maybe, but at least uh, I've gotten rid of the complex fractions. Now the next thing I'm going to do is use the same trick that I used in part A. That is, I'm going to rationalize the numerator. So I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of the numerator. Okay, let's see what we get. So in the numerator, at root x plus 1 times root x plus 1 is just x plus 1. Root x plus 1 times root x plus h plus 1 will cancel with negative root x plus 1 times root x plus h plus 1. And then finally, root x plus h plus 1 times root x plus h plus 1 is x plus h plus 1. And it's negative, of course. In the denominator, I'm going to distribute this term. So believe it or not, this whole thing is just one term, right? It's all just multiplication. So I'm going to distribute that here. I'm going to distribute it here. I'm going to have root x plus 1 times root x plus 1 will just give me an x plus 1 to the first power. And everything else stays the same. So it's going to be h times square root x plus h plus 1 times x plus 1. That's the first term. And then the second term, when I distribute the second term, x plus, root x plus h plus 1 times root x plus h plus 1 is going to be x plus h plus 1. So I'm going to get h times x plus h plus 1 times square root x plus 1. Okay. 
So look at all this tricky algebra, right? So you can see why I wanted to show you these problems. It, it's like you do nothing like this in your typical algebra classes, and then you get to calculus, and you have to do all this really complicated algebra, and then your calculus instructors uh, accuse you of not having learned your algebra well enough. Well, it's not that you didn't know algebra, it's just that you never had to work on problems like this. So hopefully you can do a little bit better in your calculus classes when you're confronted with this kind of algebra because I'm exposing it, I'm exposing you to it now. Let's go ahead and um, see if we can cancel some stuff now. So the X's will cancel, the ones will cancel. We'll be left with an H in the numerator. In the denominator, both of these terms have an H in common, which I can factor out. And then that's nice because I can cancel off the H. And look at that. Uh, I've, I've achieved my goal of uh, canceling off that H in the denominator. So I should be able to just plug in zero for H now and see what I get. Let's see. If we plug in zero there, we're going to get uh, square root x plus 1 times x plus 1. If we plug it in here, we're going to get x plus 1 times square root of x plus 1. Now, square root of x plus 1 is x plus 1 to the 1 half, right? So really what I have is, and I have two copies of this same thing. So really what I have is 2 times x plus 1 to the 1 half times x plus 1 to the first power, which we could think of as two halves, I guess, if you want. The reason I write it that way is because now you're going to add these exponents, right? You're going to get three halves. So this is 1 over 2 times x plus 1 to the 3 halves power. And that, my friends, is the derivative of this function. So kind of a, a bit of a long process, I guess. Um, oh, I feel like, yeah, I'm missing a negative sign. Look, this negative here should have made this h negative, which means this should be negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, and this should be a negative. My apologies. So, so your answer should be negative 1 over 2 times x plus 1 to 3 halves. That's the idea. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that. That'll do it for this section.